ahead and uh, get started. <clears throat> Thanks so much to everyone uh, for joining us for our first uh, public webinar of 2019, and uh, we're honored to have uh, Professor Sydney Yip, who's been with the Concrete Sustainability Hub since its founding uh, about uh, 10 years ago or so. And um, we are, as many of you know, we're completing uh, phase two of the hub, the second five years of it, and are about to embark on a third phase three. And we thought this would be a great opportunity for us to kind of both uh, take a look back at uh, some of the work that the hub has done, specifically in uh, Professor Yip's area of expertise on uh, molecular modeling and simulation, and then also use it as an opportunity to, to look forward a little bit and uh, and see where things are headed. So, um, uh, Professor Yip is, is glad, graciously uh, joining us from uh, California, where he's spending uh, a few weeks. He's a lot smarter than uh, the rest of us who uh, uh, stay here in, in, in Boston during this uh, cold winter. But uh, I'm sure his sunny disposition will um, spread into this presentation as well. So, um, just as a reminder, everyone is muted uh, to keep down background noise, uh, but there is a Q&A box in the lower right that you can use. If you put your questions in there, uh, we'll be sure to get them, and then we'll, uh, when uh, Professor Yip is done talking in about uh, a half hour, we'll be sure to pass those on to him, and hopefully we can have a good discussion. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sid, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, want to thank you for coming, uh, joining us in this uh, webinar. Uh, it's my first experience. Uh, so uh, I want to just quickly say that uh, this is fairly recent uh, development, the fact that I'm doing this seminar. Uh, but after the new year, Jeremy offered me this uh, chance to do a, do a webinar. And I thought about it a bit, and I said, yes, why not? It seemed like fun. As Jeremy said, it was just entering New Year, and the web is, uh, the hub is uh, finishing up phase two. So there is quite a bit to look back on and see where we've been. But also, there, is, uh, there was a recent uh, development at MIT just about four months ago, uh, which is quite exciting, and I thought I could talk about that. And that is the, a new college of computing being established at MIT. So you put together the, the hub and the new college computing, then you can ask, you know, what, what's next? In fact, uh, nobody knows because it's still so, so sort of evolving, fast evolving, but nonetheless, I thought it might be fun to talk about it. So because all this is fairly uh, recent, uh, last minute, uh, I ask you to sort of take this into account Feel free to ask questions, but uh, in terms of getting the answers at the end, what happens next, I think we'll have to wait. So with that said then, let me go to the uh, abstract, a synopsis that I wrote out, thought I'd read it with you, just so you see where I'm headed. I uh, want to share some personal observations on how Concrete Sustainability Hub has evolved as a collaboration as an academic industrial alliance at MIT. In the spirit of learning from the lessons we've, 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 we've had and also looking ahead to opportunities. Since the hub's founding a decade ago, molecular modeling and simulations have enabled progress toward understanding the physical properties of CSH, calcium silicon hydrate, the cement paste. In cement setting, issues of durability and related phenomena of industrial interest. Given MIT's recently declared commitments to advance the computer and computational science of artificial intelligence, we foresee an exciting role for the hub to shape the future of concrete science and technology. So as I mentioned, so this is like putting two things together, the hub and this new college and asking what's next. That's the spirit of this talk, and I'll try to make it as simple as I can, uh, knowing that there are issues of terminologies and semantics which will come up, and uh, we just have to address them as we go, because uh, there are some really wide open issues 
that I don't think uh, anyone has really thought much about before. In some sense, that's the exciting part of just sort of looking ahead, gazing at a crystal ball. Okay, we take a quick look at the uh, the hubs roadmap where we've been. Uh, the first early studies, the phase one, you might say, maybe five years into the into the uh, hub history. Uh, we focus on looking at cement setting, and that turns out to be still a relevant problem for us because the setting is a very complex uh, phenomenon, very fundamental, important uh, behavior that we are still interested in. Uh, we also looked at C over S ratio, calcium over silicon ratio. That is a matter of the chemical composition of the cement paste. It depends on you know the, the re relative amount of uh, cement powder, clinker, and water, and what have you. So that was a topic we have been studying, but I would say that you know most of our work there is finished. And this very important part, LCA, life cycle analysis, was not was sort of the industrial counterpart to the scientific part of cement setting and C over S ratio. That was very important, and we worked quite hard on that. And that continued on to phase two. Into phase two, uh, we turn our attention to uh, concrete durability in terms of damage, accumulation, failure, uh, and uh, more or less the continuation of uh, the previous uh, studies on cement setting and C over S ratio. Uh, included in that study of durability, we were interested in things like the alkali silica, alkali silica reaction, which is a well-known concern for industry. Free thaw. Uh, again, a well-known phenomenon, and they're related, and of course they have impact on pavements and buildings. So uh, this is just to say very briefly in retrospect that we have been thinking about a number of issues, but in many of these issues, we have had some success in, uh, in, in reporting our research, and those research breeds uh, research reports were all collected on the website for the hub. So feel free to take a look if you're interested in the research brief. Along with that, there's another link that's shown here that has to do with the uh, uh, peer review journal publications, and there's also a list of that. So I just want to say that if you look back on what we have done up to now, a major part of our activities was involved in computational research. This means modeling and simulation, which happens to be, uh, you, you, you know, my first love in terms of my participation in the hub. Uh, since the beginning, I've long felt that modeling and simulation or computing has an important role to play. And that's why I'm really excited now to see this new college of computing that I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. So that's coming up. Now let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the cement setting, using that as an example in the uh, in the science of concrete. So if you mix uh, concrete powder with uh, uh, with water, cement powder with water, you get a slurry. And if you just let the slurry sit there and just watch it, in this case you do experiments. You do ultrasonic experiments on the slurry you find that the strength, the stiffness, the shear modulus uh, increases with time, pretty much on its own. Okay, so it just sits there. You can see on the time scale here, we're looking at the shear modulus over several decades as a function of time in seconds. So in the first few minutes or so, you can see an increase. I'm showing you with this dotted curve here. The, the strength of the slurry increases gradually and then reaches a sort of a steady state and just seems to stay there. And that first phase of the response, so-called setting, is what we think is what's going on there is the formation of gels. So water reacts with the with, with the C3S, the, the cement powder, you you form you form gels. The, the gels are actually what we would now start to call CSH that's calcium silicate hydrate. 
So you see from this uh, dash curve that you have a first phase of gelation and then you have a second phase uh, of um, second stage of um, uh, what we call precipitation or incubation. And then so it sits there, you know, over a matter of minutes and hours. And then if you come back the next day, the slurry has stiffened, has become like a solid. So you have another three orders of magnitude increase in the strength, in the modulus. And this is, we call, you can call this the setting, or this is the jamming, this is the, the percolation where the material has, has solidified, and now it can hold more than its own weight. So the, so this entire behavior, the evolution from the beginning, uh, you know, the first few seconds, so to speak, up to up the order of hours, and maybe a few days, this entire behavior is the evolution of the cement slurry changing from liquid to stone. And that's called cement setting. There's also a phenomenon having to do with the calorimetry, the amount of heat that's given off because of this chemical reaction. That's called cement hydration. These two are sort of hand, hand in hand, but they also tell us that something complicated is going on. And what's complicated is what's useful for us. So this cement setting is an important problem well known to the in, to industry, well known to the practitioners, well known to, to everyone. But for us, at the beginning of the, uh, the start of the hub, we were very curious to see if we could understand it as a scientific challenge. So the next step there is to ask ourselves, can we explain this curve uh, as a scientist, namely think in terms of the atoms and the molecules, we know there's calcium, there's silicon, there's oxygen and hydrogen. Now, can we make a model that would somehow explain this kind of behavior, this behavior of the cement site? So here's just a picture of the model we came up with early in the study, and that's shortly after Roland Pelec joined the, the hub, and uh, he led us in the study of the creation of a uh, molecular model of cement hydrate. What you see here is a picture of what we call a model of a CSH. It's about 150 some atoms of calcium, silicon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, and this is the molecular model. You might say this is the DNA of concrete. Uh, but of course, that's just a model because that was constructed by, by, by the hub. And we published it, and we were trying to tell everyone that maybe we could start using this as a model to understand the previous behavior. So this would be one use of the model. And then we, we were rather, I would say, not so quickly, but we found out through a number of years and the collaborators that this model is not quite good enough to explain the phenomenon of setting. In particular, you can appreciate what's missing is that this is too small. This is, since we're talking about 150 atoms, and the, the, the size of this uh, system, if you, if you can call this a, a, a nanoparticle, is only nanometers, or as tens of angstroms. And that is not big enough to have enough microstructure, enough structure for, for the pace to have things like uh, porosity, things like you, you know, um, gel pores, capillary pores. So the fact that this system is not enough to, to allow us to investigate uh, the effects of porosity means that we have to go to the next step. And this next step is now work which was led by Katharina Yanudu and, uh, and her collaborators listed here. And this work is, uh, uh, was published two years ago. So from 2009 uh, to uh, two years ago, we are now able to have a, a new model or more recent, more expanded mesoscale model of CSH. And this is what you now see is the result of the modeling and simulation effort led by Katarina. And the, now the size of this cube here is roughly a micron, not a nanometer anymore. So you see you have many more particles and correspondingly from the change from the early days to the later days, we also have incre increasing uh, computing power. 
So now, as you can see, that uh, when you try to understand things from a computational point of view, you, of course, need larger and larger computers, uh, just like you would need a faster and faster car if you want to go further and further. So uh, that is the evolution path that we can point to, which uh, was undertaken by the hub. And what's on the left here is just a cartoon. It's a schematic was imagined by one of the pioneers in cement chemistry powers, and he imagined in a 2D sketch that you have this kind of opening, these will be pores. Okay, and as you can see that there's some correspondence here between the simulation uh, and the, um, and the, uh, uh, the imagination of the early pioneers. Uh, so this is now more or less where we are. We're still forging ahead to try to reach to a cement setting. But I want to show you another result, in fact, even more recent, uh, from uh, Franz Ohm and his Roland and his collaborators, which now tries to upscale from a system of atoms and molecules up to something that you might call a, a collection of buildings. So now we're going from molecules to cities, asking similar questions, namely, if you know the structure, what can you predict? What can you understand about the properties of the system? So now the system is, at this, for this discussion, is a city. And there are two examples of the cities here. One is on the top, that's Los Angeles. And then the other one is Chicago. And on the, on the left side here of my, so you can see that the, these are sort of an aerial view of how the houses, how the buildings are, are distributed in the city. You can see Los Angeles is more spread out larger. Chicago is more compact, particularly if you take downtown. So you can see that they have different structure. In other words, these will be different signatures of the different systems of different cities. The question then is, what can you make of this? Well, if you approach this by assuming that the building is isomorphic or it can be, you know, uh, can be uh, translated into something like one-for-one -one correspondence instead of atoms and molecules, you have buildings, you go back and forth, then you can use the same kind of analysis, same kind of simulation techniques that we have developed from previous studies that I've shown you into now studying entirely different objects, objects which have different structures like buildings and cities. So this is a sort of a translation from looking at molecular systems, material systems, to other systems of equal maybe as much uh, interest to society, buildings, cities, and what have you. So you, you have a different grid now. Nonetheless, which when you do this, and th this is the reason that this paper was published in, in this journal of Physical Review Letters just this past year, the reason this was published is because one can recognize something that the physicists, the scientists know, are very familiar with. Namely, Los Angeles shows the characteristic of a liquid. This is so-called pair distribution function. It basically describes the correlation between, build, between buildings next to each other. So as, as you see this curve that has large, a large peak here, this shows what we call nearest neighbor correlation. So the next door neighbors are very closely correlated. And then you talk about distributions. When you go further away, uh, the, uh, the curve is just smeared out. So they're smearing out the curve means that the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the city, uh, Los Angeles, is not as well packed, not, not as densely packed. Uh, by contrast, uh, I'm trying to find my cursor here. My, 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 my so by contrast, my pointer shows you below here that uh, Chicago looks more like a crystal. You have these peaks very periodically positioned. And that just is a reflection of the fact that you have a set of a well-ordered crystal planes, and and th th these are the sort of data you would uh, you would uh, normally uh, measure using uh, X-ray and neutron diffraction, and these data that we're showing here are actually generated by Franz uh, and his collaborators using uh, using statistics and data about the cities and, and, and the uh, distribution of buildings. So you can see now the data has changed. So, so the data on, on, on cement 
slurries and CSH and whatnot. We now have data on cities. So if you can do the same kind of analysis on different data, that becomes very powerful because now many other people can participate in the discussion. So this is the spirit I want to leave with you. Uh, and and I, I just want to say that, you know, we've learned a lot in the hub, uh, as you can see from our website. But what's exciting, and right now it's not yet clear 100%, is the fact that what we have learned may have other uses, may have other implications. So at this point, let me now switch to sort of the, the reason for the, uh, the excitement is that MIT is changing itself because it just announced uh, four and a half months ago that it's going to launch a new college of computing in strategic response to the ubiquity of computing and the global rise of artificial intelligence. So all of a sudden, MIT comes out and says, we believe that the, uh, the understanding, the study uh, of artificial intelligence is very important, not only for science and technology, for all across the Institute. So this means uh, humanities, economics, linguistics, what have you, everything that really has an important effect and impact on society now comes into discussion. Okay, so just give you a little more detail on, on the plan for this uh, College of Computing. Show you here, uh, more or less a quote. This is like a quote from the president uh, of the Institute, Raphael Reif. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to get rid of something. Uh, so the words are, the Institute is reshaping itself to foster breakthroughs in, uh, I can't get rid of my, uh, I have something that's blocking. I guess you can read it better than I can because I, I have something that's blocking it. Breakthroughs in uh, uh, the, the words is probably in the events in com computing. Yeah, in computing and AI, right? Yeah, right. So, yeah. so uh, MIT is now going to focus on trying to advance computing, which everybody more or less knows, but it's the AI part. Uh, and also at, to advance all disciplines, with special emphasis on ethical uh, issues and, uh, and societal impact. And so what, these, what MIT is going to do in the coming years is to sort of reorient itself to focus on some of the things that we've been talking about, trying to communicate with systems such as the concrete with cities with our societies, okay, on a very large scale. So if you think about this, uh, this means a, a significant investment, almost unprecedented, in the sense that the Institute, all of a sudden, given the fact the Institute is doing quite well right now, but it wants to be somewhere else in a few years because it sees an opportunity. So here are some of the details of this, uh, this uh, initiative, uh, the, the College of Computing uh, will be established this year. They're in the process of looking for the dean of the college, right? So this is a fast search. They haven't announced that person yet, but we expect an announcement almost any, any month, any day. There's roughly a billion dollar budget to make this happen. And there will be a new building in two years. So the campus indeed is undergoing quite a bit of um, reorientation, reshaping itself. And there are 50 faculty positions. So uh, this is a significant uh, activity. And uh, I'll come back and talk about the core bridge structure uh, uh, maybe late, later on because it's not the, the college is not going to set up in a traditional way of uh, schools and departments. The college is going to be set up in terms of like a like a research center. There's a core, 
Uh, and then there are bridges leading out from the core. And so the idea is that if you talk about uh, computing, computing, uh, computer science, algorithms, uh, applied math, these would be the core competence of the uh, College of Computing. The computational science, those of us who do modeling simulation for various applications, whether it's concrete or nuclear power or what have you, those who constitute bridges lead out from the core and they will impact uh, society. Okay, so this is a sort of a paradigm shift in terms of how the Institute will structure itself in order to pursue the future opportunities and future goals. So I, I think uh, this is quite exciting. And now the next question is, uh, uh, ah, okay. Uh, so in this slide, and, and this is the one that I have quite a bit of trouble with because I imagine what everyone wants to know now is that, say, what is AI? Okay, so I mean, many of us know AI. We've, we've seen AI in the newspapers and people talk about AI, but in a more um, strict sense, you can ask, you know, what is AI? It turns out that my own take is that there is really no universally accepted definition of AI. It really depends on the way in which you use, it's context driven, right? It depends on what you're talking about. But just roughly speaking, if you just ask around, you know, give me a simple definition. Uh, I've had people tell me AI is nothing more than learning from experience. Right. You don't learn because you know something. You learn because you've been told something. You you have experienced something. So it's like learning by machine, machine learning. Uh, machine learning um, from experience could be construed as you know learning by giving the set, setting down rules for the machine. You set down certain algorithms, certain rules, and the machine follows that. So you can call that machine learning. Uh, and also data-driven learning, because if you feed the data into the machine, then it knows what to do because it has the data. But if you now ask the machine to do something beyond the data, then it will not know what to do, and that's why the intelligence is only artificial. So if you take that kind of thinking, you can also start to think about modeling and simulation in materials, and we have terminologies like informatics, we have uh, uh, genomics and analytics. These are all different ways of saying, uh, you if you have data, that means you have information, and you know how to process the data, you know how to use it, you can actually drive other systems with your data, with your information. This is not so you know, hard to see what's going on when you talk about robotics, uh, autonomous vehicles, autonomous devices, and how do you control them, and, and how much do they know, how much do they not know, and so on. So all this gets rolled into this very open-ended discussion of, of, of uh, change in the way we're thinking about what we're doing. So let me just leave it there and just come back and ask the following question. The, the reason we started in the hub was to say that you know we want to understand certain problems of industrial interest. We want to innovate. We want to come up with better design, like maybe a lower CO2 emission, or maybe a faster, faster setting, or maybe a more, a, a more uh, uh, optimized additive for for the for the clinker. whatever. So why is it that the computing part? plays an important role. So I'm now trying to justify for people like us at the hub who do quite a bit of uh, modeling simulation, we've been doing for years now. Now, why is it that we can also get into the conversation? Well, I think this is a fairly long discussion and I thought I'd just leave you with these three words which can sort of take from, takes the 
the kind of problem that I've been discussing with you, which is how to interpret data. All right, if you give me the cement setting, the hydration curve, uh, whatever, uh, my goal is to understand using models and modeling and simulation, using whatever methods that I have, but computational methods, which can become more and more powerful if I have bigger and bigger computers, I can interpret the data. And everybody knows that from once you can interpret the data and you understand what are the mechanisms, why the data behave in certain ways, then you can start to manipulate the data. You can change the mechanism. You can influence the mechanism by heat, by additive, by what have you, pressure. And then from interpretation, you can go to manipulating your data. And once you can do that, and if you know what manipulation can give you, one of the things they can do for you, it can allow you to functionalize. Functionalization is a term that people use uh, in various uh, scientific circles. That means now you can give new properties, uh, new uh, activities to your system by functionalizing, by turning on some side group in some biological molecules, or by putting some additive and remo removing certain part of the setting curve. So, so this gives you control. So you can start out by looking at data, and you do lots of studies, lots of clever things and com uh, computation. Then you learn how to manipulate, and then you begin to learn to functionalize, then you make new devices. Okay, so that is a sort of a trend of thought that university people uh, are very good in, and particularly now with the coming presence of this college of computing, it seems like an opportunity to do more of those things in the arena of the problems that we're interested in. So, so in that sense, there is an opportunity for the hub to rethink what we, where we've been and also look ahead to see where we can be. Now, this is, I'm at the end, and uh, so I will just leave with you now this uh, last slide and with a question. So, so you know, all this talk of the hub and the College of Computing and putting the two together naturally brings up this question of, you know, what is the relevance of bringing these two entities together? So I just want to say that in a few, knowing how to interpret the cement setting data, for example, in terms of molecular level mechanisms will allow the critical properties of concrete to be controlled and manipulated. This is what I was just saying before. And this is only one example of solving the inverse problem. Those of us who solve forward and, and, and inverse problems know that sometimes the forward problem is when you have all the input, you just go forward and get the answer. And other times for the inverse problems, you give me the data, you ask me what does it mean? So I have to sort of back out the meaning mechanism from the data. You change the data, the meaning will cross change. So in this case, uh, we, we can go back and forth. We can solve the problem forward and backward because we have computation. We have, com we have computer, we have models. And this now creates a, you might call a new computational approach to advanced concrete design. And this approach is a bottom-up approach that you've been hearing from Franz and Roland and throughout the uh, discussions at the hub. So all this then leads to this question that I leave with you now. Can the hub, concrete sustainability, act as a bridge for society sustainability, which is the College of Computing? So the connection between the two seems like it has to be some, how much, and in what form, and how does one actually implement and start the discussions going forward well, that's the excitement, and I don't have any answers. So I thought I, the whole point of this, um, this uh, webinar is to sort of put it on the table. And again, let me remind you that this is a one man's opinion. You know, I, uh, uh, Jeremy asked me uh, to do this after the new year, and they have not been too much time. Everybody is very busy. So I haven't had a chance to really run this by anybody uh, you know, to have some sort of good feedback and, and careful discussions is all 
in front of us. And I hope that uh, this kind of discussion we have now could be the sort of a, one of the beginning. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to uh, take some uh, questions and comments. Thanks so much, Sid. That was fantastic. Like we said, we just wanted uh, to hear your th your perspective on where the hub has been and where it could go, and you certainly delivered that and given us a lot to uh, think about. So, um, just as a reminder to participants, there's the the Q and A box in the lower right. We'd love to hear your uh, questions or or thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with Sid, and we will uh, pass them along. Um, while uh, people are writing in, um, I will uh, ask a few uh, questions myself. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of um, opportunity to continue this approach for the hub of the, the, the kind of the bottom up uh, and intersect that with some of the approaches that are being discussed at the College of Computing around uh, machine learning. You know, machine learning relies on just a lot of data you know, uh, in order to learn uh, an algorithm. And I'm wondering, what do you think are some of the opportunities, you know, what are some of the data sets that either would come out of uh, 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 or, uh, modeling work or uh, experimental work that you think would be an opportunity for analysis at the molecular uh, scale or, or above? Yes, uh, Jeremy. Uh, very interesting point. Uh, you know, if, if I can rephrase what you said, is that you say, well, you know, a lot of what we're going to be doing would depend on data, but sometimes data are hard to come by, and some of the times some of the data that you want are dangerous to get. Okay, so in fact, it's they're very expensive. They're very dangerous. Uh, let me sort of take you aside and give you an example. Uh, a few years back, the, uh, uh, the national computing uh, laboratories like uh, Los Alamos and Livermore National Laboratory got into a project that they call a Strategic Computing Initiative. And that has to do with actually redesigning a nuclear weapon on the computer. All right, so now our system is not CSH, it's not cities. Our system is a sort of a nuclear weapon, and the question they ask is, can we design it on the computer entirely without going into Nevada and uh, test ground to set off a device and then take data and then try to analyze the data to see whether or not the, uh, the test was successful. Do all everything on the computer. Very ambitious, and of course we learn a lot for those of us who participate in that is that you can do some, you can do parts, but you're not really going to be able to do everything that you think you could do because there's just so many, so many uh, bottlenecks and, and gestures. Nonetheless, the appreciation of data is made very clear because one of the benefits of doing everything, if you can do it on the computer, it's just like a simulator, you don't have to crash an airplane. <laughs> You, can, you don't have to fire off a nuclear weapon in order to see what happens afterwards. So by all means, what you raise is a, is a very important question. And for those of us who are so, so sort of biased to a computing, because you know, let's say we have big computers, or we know how to use computers, or we have students who will work very hard, we can generate data that's hard for you to measure. We can generate data that you would like to have that's too expensive for you to actually go into a lab, maybe inconvenient. In particular, with regard to accident scenarios, the kind of data that we need to understand how a building will collapse you know, under accident scenarios, those are not data that you have ordinarily in the field. And those are, in fact, particularly valuable because they basically take you out to the extremes of your model. And if your model can stand up under these extreme tests, of course they will behave pretty well under normal conditions. So your question triggered this thing. For those of us who can do simulation, we can contribute to building up a database. Let's say the database can be formed from, from all the experience that the various labs can share, you know, Lafarge, Folsom, what have you. You can all share the data that you don't mind sharing 
and put it together. And I bet when you look at that database, there are still holes, there are still gaps. We don't know what happens under this pH condition. We don't know what happens under this additive kind of a, 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 a use. So for that, simulation can also, to fill in the holes, interpolate between data. But what we're saying in looking to the future is that we're all going to be sort of living on the basis of how much data we have. The more data, the better. In fact, right now, the traditional way we've been publishing, we've been releasing, uh, sharing our data is too, uh, too uh, proprietary. You know, if I publish a paper, I have a lot of data that allows me to publish the paper. I don't publish the data. Now, why not have the different authors, the different workers who publish the data, share their raw data, put it into a database. And this was actually done in the nuclear field. In, when you do anything that has a nuclear system, the, 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 the properties that we need is called cross-sections. That's the probability, probability of a nuclear reaction. Those cross-sections are very valuable and they're public. And yet still, even among the public shared between different countries and different uh, uh, labs and what have you, there are still holes. And that's why we, in nuclear physics, we need uh, new theories, new models in order to plug those holes. So this is a never ending situation, but you brought up a very, very important point. And I think uh, that's one way to say that we really need everybody to collaborate. We need to work those of us in the hub need to work with Mike Thomas, Jason Weiss, uh, in order to complement their data, their measurements, their understanding with our computational approach and really try to combine the two. So there's room for everybody. Yeah, just it. I think it's a really uh, good point, you know, particularly about the availability of the data. And it's, there are a lot of fields where you know, that's becoming a requirement to not only submit your paper, but also submit your data. And particularly in the machine learning community, that's something that they really want to see. In fact, there's all kinds of competitions now where a data set is made available and then they ask people to, you know, do use their, develop their best algorithm to come up with, uh, uh, you know, a solution to predict whatever it is that you're interested in. So I think it's an interesting, um, opportunity here to also do that for the molecular modeling to make uh, outcomes of that available to then um, potentially be used to develop other algorithms. Because as you said, the, you know, we, the, the more data that we can get, the better that the algorithms are. So. Right, right. In, yeah. So in particular, I think a university setting like MIT, like the hub, is very well suited for that because we're actually an open community. We welcome anybody to come in and join us and work with us and we share everything that we do. So in that sense, I think, uh, you, you know, the hub could be a repository of uh, certain uh, relevant, useful data for, for a cement setting, or for example. Uh, you know, we, we could start up an, an, an activity in, that in which we are actually, we're the curators, like at a museum. We, we actually know enough about what we're doing that we collect the good art pieces and we, we, where the repository, and then so if, if people start to think like that, I think there are new opportunities for people in all different uh, organizational uh, positions to link up and, and work together. After all, it's really for the society. Great. All right, we did. Uh, we got. <clears throat> uh, I guess this is more of a, a, a comment that. Uh, came in, um, but I, I think it is definitely one that's uh, relevant to what you were talking about and I think might be worthwhile for you to hear about and then comment on again. Uh, the, the, the comment is, it's interesting to see the roadmap laid out. In the past, we've had discussions on how molecular or ion mobility can be tagged into the research to explain setting behavior at temperatures and to push to another end to understand how that affects the clinkering process. So um, I, I think that whole, uh, the, the, the clinkering process even, isn't even necessarily something that you mapped out explicitly, but it is sort of an interesting connection for this 
you know, understanding the, uh, using the molecular modeling to understand the molecular and ion mobility, um, but then connecting that to actually the production of the cement and the clinkering process. So I wonder if that's something you also see opportunities for. Yes, I, you know, I, I don't know that much about clinkering process, but I can imagine what, what is being referred to is how do you make the clinker? Uh, yeah, yeah. How, how do you fire up? You know, yep. this this is where the CO two release comes in. Do you do you make C three S? Do you make C two S? Uh, A lights and B lights. And uh, yeah, and, and I I think uh, you know the one, one thing I you know I'm biased uh, of course. Uh, I think one can do a lot with modeling and simulation. And looking at the behavior of the slurry as in setting is only an example. You could also ask you know how do you get the clinker? How do you produce the clinker from, so any kind of um, material processing can be modeled and simulated. And, and I will jump back and say that, remember that the thing that makes the cement setting problem interesting, relevant, but hard, is because it's time dependent, okay? We call attention to the fact that things happen over many time scales, over seconds, over minutes, over days, hours, and days. And, and each time, oh, for each particular time scale, something different is happening. So you have to solve the problem of clinker in a holistic manner. You have to think about everything from the beginning over several time scales. You have the, the time scale of seconds, and then you go to hours, you go to days. And things happen in, in the right time scale. And if you're not in the right time scale, you're not really addressing the real issue. Okay, so one of the things that our provost, when he d d described the, uh, the, the new college, he said, we're trying to solve these important problems at scale. Namely, you have to pay attention to what scale are you talking about, because everything is in real time, right? So, you, so one of the, one of the um, vexing, one of the really bottlenecks that we have right now is that the molecular simulation that we all know about is molecular dynamic simulation, and that's confined to a very, very short time scale. So when it comes to trying to understand cement setting over hours and days, uh, those short time scale simulations are really not the best kind. If we could, we should like to go to longer time scale simulation. We have actually made some progress in that front, and uh, we, have, we have not demonstrated that progress uh, in the case of uh, cement setting, but we have some success in demonstrating it in the problem of creep, as, as Jeremy, as you may know. So we can now take creep and not a CSH uh, paste, but we can take a metallic glass sample, which is, you know, somewhat, it's a disorder system. We can look at how creep evolves over time. And uh, there is progress on the scientific side that one can talk about that. So this, but just one example to say that, yes, uh, the uh, simulation, uh, modeling simulation we have in mind are really quite powerful, and it can certainly include looking at processing of materials, not only at performance and how the materials behave after it's made. How you make it can also be included in the discussion. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much, Sid. I think uh, that's all the, the comments that we had, but you've given us a lot to think about, and um, uh, particularly as we uh, look forward to continuing with the Hub and, as you said, a lot of these uh, opportunities for us that exist. So, so thanks so much for your time, for connecting with us all the way from uh, California, and uh, we'll be uh, posting this to YouTube so that other people can um, listen to it in case they missed it and uh, hope that uh, everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks so much. Thank Bye. you, Jeremy. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.